down in our own yards and then have um, a guest the second half, which is a great segue to Adam, who's been very patient over there. Um, I would like to um, introduce Adam Cruiser. He's a delegate of the International Dark Sky Association. Uh, he's also a passionate, passionate about native plants and is a former chairman of the Glen Ellen Environmental Commission. Um, so he's one of us and uh, take it away, Adam. Well, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Hi, Sags. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually had this old sign in my office. This is a no. sign that we had when I was with the Glen Ellen Environmental Commission wow. and it's, we support pollinators. And we had a uh, co-sponsor initiative. So it was the village itself with the park district. And I think we ultimately sold as many as 200 of these. Oh. And uh, they're littered all over Glen Ellen and people's front yards and Basically, people had to commit to planting milkweed and things of that nature. So, yeah. Is that made out of metal? What is it made out of? That's so, and you got that, you bought those for $2 because we're looking at signs and that's a very nice sign. And you, you, you paid just $2 a piece for those? Well, the money, and we gave a lot away too. So mm -hmm. the money came from uh, the village of Glen Ellen. Okay. Village of Glen Ellen. Back, back in the day with the Glen Ellen Environmental Commission, which is still active, don't get me wrong. Um, we actually had a little budget mm -hmm. that we received through you know, submitting a request to the village. And then the Glen Ellen Park District had, of course, their little budget too. So we were able to buy a lot of these signs and put them together. And you know, ultimately what we wanted to do was to make them affordable so that costs wouldn't be a consideration. Right. Do you because recall? You want, it, you want to spread the word. You want to spread the word as best you can. Exactly. That's why we're looking at signs. But then, I mean, in an ideal world, we'd be able to hand them out free. But when you start looking at the price of them, then that that's your your budget is shot. That's why I'm very yeah. curious. That's a nice sign. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it it we have one in our yard. My wife and I, Nancy and I, and we've had it in our yard for a long time and it withstands all the winter months and everything else and we've got a sign also from the conservation foundation mm -hmm. because we've got everything that they want including a, ra a rain barrel hmm. so okay. we, we display we display both of those signs very proudly with our milkweed well um thanks again um i'm here to talk on behalf of the international dark sky association I am a delegate with the International Dark Sky Association, otherwise known as the IDA. There's, uh, I think there's maybe three or four active delegates currently in the state of Illinois. There's delegates here, there, and everywhere else. Um, and as Catherine said, generally speaking, I'm all about nature. I'm all about the cycle of life and things like that. So let me start my screen share. Okay, I hope everybody can see that. No, we don't see it yet, <clears throat> Adam. Oh. And while, while Adam is sharing his screen, I might recommend that anyone, uh, others might like to turn off your videos. It will help the bandwidth. <clears throat> okay. Well, let me try this again then. Did it come up then? No. no. Well, I don't know what's going on here. It should be working. I think there might be another button when you select your screen, and then there should be another button in the bottom right-hand corner. There you there go. go. OK, now we're in business. Sorry, everybody. No worries. I've done this so many times, you think I know how to do it by now. <laughs> um, so uh, here's my first slide. Now this is typically a presentation that might take as many as, as 50 minutes. So um, I'm gonna try to whistle through it pretty quickly. Um, 
the International Dark Sky Association is an international organization. So it's a 501c3 that's been uh, around and doing business internationally for about 35 years now. Uh, the International Dark Sky Association has pr a presence and I believe as many as 51 or 52 countries currently. There are as many as I believe 150 International Dark Sky certified locations, municipalities, parks, national parks, things of that nature. Um, it's a very active organization. It is the organization internationally, the leading um, organization with respect to trying to address artificial light at night. And what I'm going to be addressing with everybody is outdoor lighting. I'm not, I'm not going to be chatting about indoor lighting. Um, Thomas Edison invented the light bulb in, I believe it was 1879. Um, we didn't have light bulbs before then. Um, I believe that uh, Van Gogh painted Starry Night in 1993. As of then, you know, there might have been some gas lamps and and so on and so forth uh, in the area where he lived. But when he painted Starry Night, there were stars in the sky above him. Um, and now only over a short period of time, um, we're, uh, we're confronted with an explosion of light pollution, which is kind of uh, uh, what you can see here with this slide. So we've got slides that move from 1950s to 1970s to 1997, uh, forecasting for a couple of years from now. And if you look at the 1950s, you know, just look in our area here, look how little light pollution there is. There's no light pollution over the Great Lakes, for example. But as you move to the 70s and the 90s, and especially, you know, with the uh, with the introduction of LED lights, which we want to have because they save energy, tremendous amounts of energy. But with the, with the introduction of LED lights, we have just this explosion of light pollution, which as you can see, consumes Lake Michigan, even though there aren't any lights on Lake Michigan. Um, now, most people uh, throughout the world live in urban areas. Uh, so this statistic uh, takes that into consideration, but regardless, only two out of 10 people on the earth, wherever we live, can actually see the Milky Way. I don't know if everybody here has had an opportunity to see the Milky Way. I did, of course, growing up in Michigan, uh, rural Michigan, but you know, I can't go outside and see it now. Um, the International Dark Sky Association kind of uses the Milky Way as a marker, you know, for something that we want to try to achieve when we go outdoors and we enjoy the night skies. 99% of the US and Europe now live under light polluted skies. Whereas of course, 100 years ago, we didn't have any light pollution. I uh, just, I like to run through a couple slides. This is uh, the Milky Way and of course stars um, on a beautiful evening um, out west. Uh, a little bit of astronomy every star that we can see at night is from our Milky Way galaxy. And uh, I believe there are 300 billion solar systems within the Milky Way galaxy. Um, we're one of them. Uh, of course, our sun is a star. So um, all the stars that we can see at night are from our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, typically, if we didn't have light pollution, or if we were in a more rural area, for example, we might be able to see as many as 2000 stars with our naked eye on, on, a, on a good night. Uh, but now, uh, especially in the area where we live and where I live, which is in Glen Ellen, um, we can only see even on the best night about 31 to 40 stars. So here's another picture, time-lapse kind of picture. And another picture, you know, just to remind us about the kind of things that we'd like to be able to see. And, and I always like to include this picture because it has Neowise. Last summer, my wife and I tried to see Neowise. We'd go in the back backyard and there's a park, there's kind of a park that backs up to us. And we just went outside and tried to see it every night and we just could not find it because of course our, our night sky was so bright. 
So light pollution, um, the International Dark Sky Association typically talks about three forms of, of light pollution, sky glow, which we see every night. And sometimes it's, it's even more significant on a cloudy night because all the light that's going up is, is being distributed through the clouds. And of course, those clouds are so much more close to us uh, spatially. So uh, sky glow, um, glare, and light trespass, which is kind of light glare. Here we can see a lot of sky glow over this city here. Sky glow is uh, basically light that's allowed to go out and go up. And once that light goes up into the atmosphere, it just, because of physics and so on, it just explodes through the sky. So for example, it finds its way over Lake Michigan, finds its way over locations where there is not actual lights on the ground. Um, you can see here on the right, we have a little bit more sky glow and on the left, we have a little bit less sky glow. Sky glow is nothing more or less than wasted light. It's light that we've allowed to go into the sky and uh, prohibit us from being able to see the stars. And also it affects us, wildlife and pretty much everything that's on the earth. And we'll chat about that in a minute. So glare, we see glare every day, you know, as we're moving around. Um, you have glare when you're, you're in your car, you might have uh, some lights from, from headlamps that are very bright. And as you're driving, you know, you're kind of uh, almost blinded by the lights of another car. And it, it almost prevents you from even seeing everything else. Um, uh, maybe even pedestrians, it might be um, on the sidewalk or, or whatever. So uh, glare is very obtrusive. And now that we have LED lights, and again, we want LED lights because of course they're, 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 they're so cost effective and they reduce our consumption of fossil fuels and so on and so forth. But now even more with the LED lights, especially with the blue, white, color of LED lights, the glare is becoming even, even significantly worse. So what happens with glare? Well, I think all of you kind of know this from your own experiences, our pupil constricts. So as a result of that, there's less light coming through our eye into our photoreceptors. Um, so our depth of field is reduced, our reaction time is reduced because of course our we're fighting that light that um, we don't necessarily want. And, and that kind of uh, takes, takes us right into the myth about whether more lighting is, is safer. Uh, more lighting is not safer. You know, when I talk to people and a lot of times when I get chat questions and things of that nature, uh, a lot of people express concerns about security. There, there is not one uh, study uh, peer-reviewed study that actually definitively concludes that more light um, makes you, makes us more safe. What we have found is that better designed light, lighting, fixtures, lighting, um, uh, makes us more safe. So a nice example is, 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 is this slide. As we look to the left, we can see um, we've got a, a flood lamp there um, on the side of this, this home, this garage. And when we look in the area of that lamp, our eyes are focused on that light to the, to the exclusion of everything else. Our, our depth, our field of depth is, is, is reduced. Um, so that light is coming in, it's, it's, it's restricting our pupils and less, less light is, is basically uh, being received by us. So we're seeing less of everything else around us. We're seeing less of our environment. We're just focused on that light. But if we put that, if we put our hand over that light, like you can see in this, this slide, and you can do something similar outside in your own neighborhood or your own lawn, our pupils are, are opening, they're expanding. We're allowing more light in, which we would typically do, naturally do on a dark night that's not otherwise lit. And we're now able to see all of our environment better because we're not blinded by the glare of that light. And we can see the man, um, the gentleman at the fence who's been there the whole time. So better designed lighting 
is actually more safe. Uh, light trespass. It, some of you might, you know, have the issue at your home um, with your neighbors. So especially now with the LEDs, I don't know if you've noticed, but some LED lights are very white. They're very bright white. And uh, unlike the old Thomas Edison's that we used to have, uh, they're, they're much more intense. Um, so they're almost just like a bullet coming at us from wherever they might be, especially outdoors. And we end up having um, light come into our bedrooms, um, even at all times of night, we're now putting down shades and things of that nature to try to make you know, our homes a little bit darker at night. And this light pollution is affecting our wildlife too. So not only our little animals, but especially importantly for, for your group, I think it's, it's affecting our pollinators significantly, our nocturnal pollinators. So what are the light pollution consequences? Um, energy waste is a big one. Um, you know, every time that we have a light on that we don't otherwise need, we're wasting energy. Three to $7 billion a year, every year, is spent on unneeded outdoor lighting um, here in just the United States. And about 21 million tons of fossil fuels which of course contribute to climate change and our changing climate, which affects our native species and our pollinators and everything else on the plant. Planet is burned unnecessarily by that, um, that unfortunate um, waste of energy just by keeping our lights on. So if you can find, kind of follow this a little bit with respect to energy waste, 13% of residential electricity use in the U.S. is for outdoor lighting, just for outdoor lighting. Um, and, and that's residential electricity use. Um, about 35% of that outdoor lighting, just that outdoor lighting, residential lighting is completely wasted. And, and the form of the waste is, is basically because of the fixture that we choose to use. So instead of focusing that light down where we, I think, really want it to begin with, we're allowing that light to escape out and up, which again is costing us about $3 billion per year uh, worth of energy lost to SkyGlow, which for each person, including children, um, in the U.S. is the equivalent of $10 a year. And we end up burning more more fossil fuels. And in order to basically address the amount of fossil fuels that we're burning because of this wasted energy, we would, we would need to plant a huge number of, of, of trees just to offset the contribution that we're making to um, greenhouse gas emissions. Human health, um, incredibly the uh, the, the white blue LEDs um, very much affect us. And for the most part, that takes the form of an effect on a hormone known as melatonin, which um, some of you may have heard of more recently because there's been a lot of discussion about um, whether melatonin uh, can help us address uh, COVID, for example. Back in 2016, when um, the American Medical Association started to study the effect of blue-white LEDs, uh, especially with respect to LEDs that were starting to uh, be installed by municipalities with their street lamps, the AMA published this guidance. And basically what they said was these blue-white LEDs that basically simulate daylight at night are very much affecting the release of melatonin and very much affecting um, our wildlife friends, including birds, insects, turtles, fish, toads, frogs, what have you. Um, some of you might have heard, for example, that uh, turtles that are finding their way from their eggs when they hatch um, to the ocean, instead of going to the ocean, they're going to the lights, maybe across the street because they, they are attracted to the brightest light source. Why? Because 
over all those centuries, they've always thought that brightest light source is the ocean and the moon on the ocean and things of that nature. Well, they don't know the difference now. They're just looking for the brightest energy source. So instead of going towards the ocean, they're going toward the streets. And uh, unfortunately, they're being crushed by automobiles. So the AMA has already proclaimed, hey, everybody, think twice about the type of LED bulb that you use. Just recently, there's been some publications about the mysterious link between COVID-19 and sleep. And a lot of that is generated from the study of melatonin, the release of melatonin at night, and the benefit of melatonin, which is uh, basically um, our circadian rhythm. So melatonin is the one hormone that we have of this 80 or some hormones that we have naturally that um, helps us to sleep at night. And if we get artificial light at night, whether inside our home or outside our home, coming inside our home, that can affect the release of melatonin, which affects our sleep and leads to a huge variety of diseases, including um, some cancers. Why am I getting that? Oop, okay. Uh oh. All right, kids, I don't know what happened to my screen share. All right, are we back? Yes, we are. Thank you. All right. Well, I don't know why this is now Do, stopped. Click edit, ed, enable editing at the top in that yellow bar. Well, now I can't get out of it. I'm sorry, everybody. No worries, take your time. It's worth waiting for. Okay, are we back? Yes, we are. I don't know why this is happening though. I can't get rid of that. Okay, there we go, I'm sorry. So anyway, there's another study about whether melatonin can help treat COVID-19. And uh, this was done by the Cleveland Clinic. Um, so anyway, uh, you, you, for example, you might've heard that you don't wanna have your tablets on for the hour before you go to bed, or you don't wanna use your iPhone during the hours before you go to bed. And that's because of the blue white light that's being emitted by those handheld devices. And now incredibly enough, people are selling blue blocker glasses to try to reduce our exposure to that blue, that blue white light that's coming from LEDs, for example. So what are some of the ecological impacts? I think, does that come from TV televisions too? Um, it can, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so um, to address indoor uh, lights, for example, um, anytime you use a rich blue white LED, which is basically a 5,000 Kelvin bulb, and we'll talk about that, whether it's part of just your bulb inside your house or um, part of your television or part of your computer or whatever the case may be, you're affecting the release of that melatonin. For whatever reason, uh, we have the melatonin we have that hormone through all the centuries and the generations that we've been here on the planet. And it's basically uh, through our physiology over all these generations, it's basically only emitted when it's dark. It helps us sleep. And it also helps significantly from what we now know from new research, it also helps significantly uh, uh, help our autoimmune system so that we can better combat disease. 
So we've got less obesity, we've got less diabetes, we've got, we've got a host of other diseases that melatonin is help, helping us confront. Um, and anytime we got that blue white light, whether inside the home or outside the home, we're affecting the release of that hormone. There's a big study now about you shouldn't have your kids on um, their handhelds uh, during that hour before they go to sleep and that their use of these handhelds are affecting their ability to sleep at night and it's affecting their health. So a huge amount of studies being done, especially during the past 10 to, 10 to 15 years with uh, the significant increased use of LED lights. So talking about people, you know, we've got technology that we can use to help address some of these situations. We've got shades that we can put down. We've got blue blocker glasses we can use. We've got uh, Lux apps that we can download into our computers so that that bright white light is automatically reduced and filtered out at a certain time of night. Um, but our animal friends, our insect friends, they don't have the benefit of all, the, of all this technology. And they've been around longer than we have. And they're their systems have, you know, basically generated um, everything they've got going through all the generations that, that they've been around. They, they don't, for example, have a GPS. So they rely on the stars, they rely on the moon and so on and so forth to navigate at night to get around. Um, they don't have the benefit of GPS. So when it's light out, they're affected by that. Um, they don't know how to address these bright white lights at night like we do. And that kind of gets us right into Doug Tulamey's book. Um, Doug has very much been addressing the effect of light pollution at night on our wildlife friends, insects and birds specifically. So that's more or less what I'm going to focus on now. We are in an insect apocalypse right now. And of course, you've been talking about that with respect to the monarchs and trying to make a difference with, with the monarchs. The monarchs are diurnal pollinators. 40% of all our pollinators that pollinate our plants are diurnal pollinators. 60% of all the pollinators that pollinate our plants are nocturnal. There's as many pollinators flying around at night as there are during the day. And most of those pollinators are moths. We are having a moth apocalypse. And you might remember that Doug Tulamey discussed that a lot, right? We want moths, we want caterpillars. That, there's that whole cycle of life. So when we have these bright white LEDs, what happens? Well, the moths are circling that light because they perceive it to be the moon or a star. And of course it's right there. The moon's right there. So they're very happy to circle it. The problem is that they're circling it, they're tiring and they're dying and they're, they're more or less at our feet when they should otherwise be pollinating, laying eggs and doing everything that nature intended them to be doing. Moths are bird food and without moths in the form of caterpillars or whatever the case may be, we're affecting birds. Turn off the lights because nighttime lights kill moths. Um, anytime we're affecting insects and especially pollinators, you know, let's remember, as you heard from Doug Thalamy, we're affecting ourselves because of course we rely on the pollinators to pollinate the plants that that uh, produce all the food that we eat. Uh, curiously, light pollution, apart from moths and other nocturnal pollinators, light pollution also has a very significant effect on lightning bugs, <laughs> which I found to be just fascinating. I don't know if, if all of you have noticed, but there's so much fewer lightning bugs around. When I was a kid, they were, they were everywhere. We'd run outside and we'd catch them night after night after night. Well, because of uh, glare and light trespass and all that light that's sitting on our lawns now, either in our own lawn from our own lights or from our neighbor's lights, 
these, these lightning bugs, they can't find each other. They actually use this bioluminescence to mate. And because of the artificial light at night, they're not mating as frequently, so there's fewer of them there. So moving from insects, um, of course, let's go up the food chain a little bit and we've got birds. Not only do birds rely on the insects, the caterpillars and everything else to feed their fledglings and so on, but um, birds rely on the dark, especially at night when they're migrating. Um, as you discussed with the monarchs, uh, this area, including Chicago where we live, is one of the huge uh, paths for migrating birds. Um, and, and actually, incredibly, uh, Chicago is, has been labeled the number one most hazardous, dangerous location for migrating birds in the United States. Um, so at now, for example, we have tons of songbirds and other birds flying way up in the sky at night. We don't even know they're there. During the day, they're on the ground and they're feeding. They're feeding on those, on those insects and, and seeds and things of that nature. But at night, when they're fueled up, they're in the air and they're flying, they're flying north, wherever the case may be. And then, and then of course, south in, in, in the fall. So, I'm sorry. So artificial lights um, very much disorientate birds um, during their migration. Again, they, they're looking for stars and the moon and everything else as a navigational tool. So when they see buildings with artificial lights um, at the windows that are up on the top levels and on the antennas and things of that nature, that, that for whatever reason, they're just attracted to it. So they come out of their flight pattern and they come down to locations where they wouldn't otherwise be, sometimes running out of fuel. And if, if they don't have a collision directly with the building that's lighted, um, some of them become confused and they circle and they circle and they circle, they become weak and vulnerable and they, they land. And of course, many of them die. I don't know if you've heard, but there are many um, uh, cities that are now becoming lights out cities through tremendous efforts by volunteers like you guys. Um, you know, to try to approach cities and say, hey, can you turn those lights off at night, and especially during the spring and fall migration periods. Philadelphia just agreed to join the Lights Out Initiative. Chicago is a Lights Out Initiative city. Not completely, but a lot of good people are trying to make a huge difference to reduce the amount of light pollution in our cities at night. For us at the ground level, when the birds do come down for whatever reason, they're attracted to the lights that might be on in our home. And they're attracted, uh, like they're attracted to um, the lights that, are, that might be in atriums of the buildings. They see the, they see the plants and they wanna go inside, so they hit the window. And uh, that doesn't always work well for them. Uh, a study by the Field Museum in Chicago found that turning off the lights at one downtown high rise reduced migratory bird death there at that building by 80%. So the research is very firm in this, in this, in this area. Um, migrating birds are hitting lighted buildings. So not only do we have an insect apocalypse with the moths that circle around and lightning bugs and so on and so forth, but we have a bird apocalypse now too. Now that's caused by chemicals and things of that nature that we put in our lawns, but um, research is showing that light pollution at night, especially now with these bright LEDs is a significant contributor. So can we make a difference? You betcha. And it's a pretty simple process. You know, you're, you're talking, I'm, I'm just, I was so uh, wonderfully pleased, you know, just listening to all of you kind of brought back things that we used to talk about in the Environmental Commission. Who wants to change? Well, we all raise our hand and we want to do it. And then of course, who wants to change? And fewer people are prepared to commit that time to make a difference. 
And then who wants to lead the change? Well, you know, a lot of people find the door. So, you know, from what I'm hearing, you're all leaders and whether it's with native plants or dark sky at nights or whatever floats your boat, um, to the extent that you want to lead, uh, that would be terrific. So how can we do that? Um, I think somebody said they're from Homer Glen. Homer Glen was the first municipality in Illinois to become international dark sky certified. And they work very hard at trying to keep their commercial and residential uh, properties um, uh, dark sky certified with respect to fixtures and light bulbs and things of that nature. Hawthorne Woods just became the world's newest international dark sky community. Now, in order to get dark sky recognition, you have to do some things. For example, you have to encourage your village to pass an ordinance or sign a pledge like you're doing you know, with your monarch effort. And, and then hopefully uh, other things happen too. But if, if you do take those steps and you do satisfy those guidelines, um, you can become an international dark sky certified municipality, but you can do a lot of things in your municipal areas that are just basically dark sky friendly. And you can do a lot of those things at your home, which is what we're going to chat about now. So um, now, especially now that we're all putting in LEDs um, outdoors, uh, and we should, because again, we're fighting climate change by reducing our energy use. Um, Making a difference at home is very much important. And what I did when I decided to take this venture, this, this uh, exciting adventure, um, I wrote little letters to everybody on my street. And this is the first letter I sent. And I focused on the lightning bugs because of course the kids love the lightning bugs so much. And I, I think uh, by the time I sent my second letter, which kind of addressed moths and pollinator week and things of that nature and the monarch butterfly and the importance of pollinators, I wanna say about 75% of my little street made a difference. People started to turn off their lights at night. They didn't have them on all night or they changed the type of light bulb that they were using. And, and a couple people actually changed the fixtures they were using. So. Everything you, you, you're, you're talking about tonight, you know, those little things can make a difference. So what do we do with respect to fixtures, light bulbs, and so on and so forth? Well, the, the, the good news is it really doesn't cost any money. And to the extent that you're thinking about making improvements or going out and buying new bulbs or whatever the case may be, it's not going to cost you an extra cent. So these are the five little things we wanna to try to remember with respect to addressing outdoor light pollution at night. Um, all light should have a clear purpose. If we don't need the light, then you know maybe think about turning it off at night. Sometimes we just turn the lights on because it's a habit. We have certain lights that um, are always on. Um, so the first thought is, well, do we really need that light? Can I turn off that light? How much do I need that light at night? When do I need it? If we, if we do need some lights on at night, and I get it, um, we want to try to use the proper fixture. We want that light to be targeted downward, more or less at a 45 degree angle. We don't want it to shine out horizontally and certainly we don't want it to shine up. So shielding is very important, very important. The light bulb itself shouldn't be no brighter than necessary. A lot of this really bright white light that we see is not just because of the Kelvin, the color temperature of the bulb, but the amount of brightness that we use. And we measure brightness by watts and lumens. So with the Tommy Ed bulbs that we've always been buying historically, you kind of look for 40 watts or 60 watts or 75 watts or 100 watts. And the 100 watt bulb is, is brighter. Well, the 40 watt bulb is dimmer, it's less bright. So for um, uh, LEDs, a 40 watt bulb is a 450 lumen bulb. A 60 watt bulb is an 800 lumen bulb. So those are the kind of terms that we're looking for when we choose to buy the brightness level with our bulb. Um, if, again, if we need to have a light on at night, can we control it? 
right? Motion sensors work for a lot of people. Um, dimmers, these LED lights, most of them are dimmable. You'll want to look for a dimmable bulb. If you have the luxury of having an opportunity to time your lights at night, the ones that you want to keep on, you can actually dim that brightness, maybe 40, 60, 70%. And a lot of the municipalities and, and uh, the people that have more of a structure with respect to all their lights can do that quite easily. And then lastly, the color of the bulb. We want to use 2700 Kelvin bulb. That's a warm, that's a warm light. So let's, let's look at that. Shielding first, um, I think you all know what I'm talking about. Um, you can look at this example here on the left. This is not shielded. All that light is shining out. It's glare, it's light trespass. But if we put on the right fixture, all that light is shining down. It's focused down on the apron where probably, you know, you want it anyway. That's, that's the intent. So worst is, of course, no shielding at all. And sometimes we got the globe lamps and I get it. We want to keep the globe lamps because, it, because they're kind of vintage. Well, then we want to you know, think twice about the bulb we're putting in that globe lamp. And we get to the right and we've got the best kind of shielding, shielding that light down, not out and up. These are some fixtures uh, that are at the Home Depot. Um, near my home, you can see on the left, we've got uh, fixtures that are more dark sky friendly. Um, they're shielding that light down, some of them, not all of them, but some of them. And then on the left, I'm sorry, on the right, um, you can see that we have uh, more dark sky compliant fixtures. It's the hooded fixture, basically. Okay, you want that bulb to be up inside the fixture. You don't want the bulb, we, we don't want to see the bulb basically, right? We want to see the light coming down from the fixture. And the good news is that these fixtures are no more expensive than any other fixture that you, you might choose to buy, including a lot of these coach lamps that we see. I just took this picture the other weekend at the Menards near me. You can see we've got a couple dark sky compliant fixtures here. $24. You can see above a, a not dark sky friendly fixture, $40. This is a page from the, the uh, um, International Dark Sky Association website. They can give you examples of what's acceptable and unacceptable. And what's kind of exciting is that if you find something that you want, you can push that fixture, you can prompt that fixture and it'll take you directly to the store where you can buy it and you can buy it online. So you don't even have to leave your home. You look at the IDA site, you find a fixture, a dark sky friendly fixture that you like, directs you exactly to the store where you can buy it. You can buy it and it'll be delivered to your home. So light bulb, uh, that blue light we were talking about, um, that's Kelvin. So if you look at your new uh, uh, light bulb packages, you're going to see somewhere on that box, it'll be there, a Kelvin score. So you'll see something like 2700K or 3000K or 5000K. 5000K is that blue white light that I've been talking about that's so harmful to us and our wildlife friends, including our pollinators the light that simulates daylight at night, the light that's really causing us big problems that we have to move away from. Um, that's at 5,000 Kelvin. So for outdoors, please don't, don't, don't put those bulbs in. Choose to use something less, less uh, white. So you're gonna move down to that warm white to our left and you're gonna see that that's 2,700 to 3,000 Kelvin. 2,700 is gonna be more than enough for you, believe me. It's kind of similar to what we always had anyway, before we started to move to these bright white light LEDs. And you can use those inside your home too, you know, if you choose to. Some of us might like to have that 5,000 Kelvin bulb, you know, wow, that's great. We can now see so much more because it's so much more light, bright light. Maybe we need it in the basement, you know, or something, or maybe in the garage for some reason. 
So, you know, here you can kind of see the bulbs, right? You got the 5,000 in the middle, not what we want to use outdoors. We want to move down to that 2,000, 3,000 range. So with the package itself, now you're not going to, these, these are from uh, Home Depot. There's a lot of different manufacturers selling bulbs, but you can see here on this package that you've got a choice of soft white, bright white, and daylight. And that's typically what you're going to find at most of your hardware stores, regardless of the package. The soft white is another name for 2700 Kelvin. Really, you don't want to do anything more than the soft white outdoors. The bright white is typically 3000 Kelvin. You can still use it outdoors. It's still IDA compliant, but in my humble opinion, just too much. And then of course we want to stay away from that daylight bulb, which is 5000 Kelvin. And then you'll see here, you've got the 60 watt here on these packages. You can see for each type of light, each Kelvin score, um, that's 800 lumens. Now that's going to be plenty bright. If you need 800 lumens for whatever reason, I get it. But please don't use more than 800 lumens. Please don't use more than 60 watts outdoors. And if you can use 40 watts, which is 450 lumens, all the better. So shielded, soft white, which is a 2700 Kelvin, and a lumen, a watt, that's at 40, 450. That's what I would prefer. I have a really hard time finding a soft white choice with flood lamps, um, but I did find some at the Home Depot. So you can see here, you got the soft white choice, you got the bright white choice, and of course you'll have the daylight choice somewhere. It can be hard to find the soft white choice with a, with a flood light, but uh, if you can find it, terrific. And again, do what you can to reduce those lumens. These are 65 watts. Sometimes you can't find lumens that are any, any less than about 1,200 lumens. Um, it's, it's quite obnoxious, really. So here's an example of a beautiful IDA, IDA compliant process. And you can see the stars and we're not killing our pollinators and all that stuff. So you got the nice shielded fixture, you've got the nice 2700 bulb and you've got something that's less bright. And instead of a lot of sky glow on your left and a lot of glare, this is the same picture, the same location. You know, you've now got the Milky Way and you've got some stars. Now it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's intended to be a before and after perspective. So there you go. I kind of raced through it quickly um, because I know we're all getting a little bit tired, but uh, please, if you have the time, go to www.darksky.org. Um, you'll learn so much more there at that website than you will from me. It'll discuss with you all the effects of bright LED lights on wildlife and pollinators and uh, all the things that are important to your, your impressive group. And there I am. So anyway, that's the slideshow. Does anybody have any questions for Adam? I do. Go ahead, Julie. Adam, does your yes. organization do anything with condominium associations to enlighten them? Yeah, well, what we do do is pretty much dependent on people like me. Um, unless we can just occur, encourage condominium associations through whomever's on the board or whatever the case may be to just go to the IDA website itself. The International Dark Sky Association is very dependent on its volunteers, like of course your group is. Um, but I can go to a homeowners association, I can discuss with them, hey, can you think twice about requiring certain fixtures that everybody use? Can you think twice about the fixtures that you're using on your streets? Can you choose to use a different bulb? 
So that's the kind of conversation that you would have a, with a homeowners association. Mm -hmm. There are examples of things like letters. They have examples on the IDA website. There are examples of things that you can do with respect to homeowners associations on the IDA website. It'd be nice if new developments had to follow that. Well, very much so. And, and really to do that, it, it's either got to be in your, your, uh, your uh, association bylaws, your rules and regulations, or for municipalities with your ordinances. So um, for Homer Glen, for example, you, you have an ordinance that I think they allow 3,000 Kelvin at most. So with any new development, um, basically the village is trying to enforce, which is tough. Um, the village is trying to enforce the type of fixtures and the type of bulbs and the brightness levels that uh, developers are, are choosing to, um, to use. That's wonderful. Yeah. Anybody else? Do we have anything in the chat? There's nothing in the chat right now. Um, there is one. Do solar lights affect birds? Oh, yeah. I didn't see that one. Let me see if I can open up the chat here. <laughs> yeah, that's my question. Do solar lights, especially those lights that you put in on along the pathway, do they affect moths and stuff? It doesn't seem like they. Yeah. Well. Much. Right. Um, remember, most of your solar lights are very close to the ground. So, yeah. and they're very, they're not very bright. Um, and most of them have some level of hooding. Um, uh, so I don't know that solar lights are affecting our pollinators and the birds significantly. Uh, of course, solar lights are terrific from the perspective that we're reducing our use of fossil fuels. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. You're welcome. Thank you, Adam. This was wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I hope that you think twice about the lights that you're using in your own, your own yard. Um, you know, look look at what look at what you're doing with respect to your neighbors. For example, are your lights shining out on your neighbors' homes? You know, I'm sitting here right now, and the the yard, the house behind me, there's this really bright light that they have on by their door and it's just glaring in the window here. You know, it's like now I'm becoming conscious of that. And it's like, why, what is the purpose of that? I could see when they put their dog out, but it's just on all the time. And it's always this glaring light coming right in the kitchen window. Yeah. And you know, they could probably provide all the level of security they need for their dog or for themselves if they had that light with a better fixture that directs that light down and with a soft white light that's 2700 Kelvin without all the brightness. Mm -hmm. You know what that bright light's also doing? If it's a bright white light, it's also causing the moths to circle. Um, so of course they're killing the moths too that might otherwise be pollinating your yard, Catherine, and your mm -hmm. plants. So, um, should we be buying those yellow lights, even the old incandescent? You know, I mean, I I have some up in my cabinet. I'm just wondering, should, should they go, or should I be just going for um, a softer, you know, a less luminate uh, lumen? Yeah. Well, the, the 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 yellow light that you're probably talking about is not an LED. Right. Um, no, it's not. Yeah. So you're using more energy with that light. The LEDs use remarkably less light. Um, so but what's better? What's better for the moths? The yellow or or both are equivalent? Well, the yellow would be great. Yeah. So if you want to use something that's not an LED light, you want to use a yellow light, then terrific. But okay. you know, again, you want to think about, well, what fixture am I using that? Right. Okay, am I, can I actually see the bulb? Okay, or is the bulb shielded? This is a uh, 2200 Kelvin bulb, an LED light. And you're, you'll see these a lot more now because they have kind of an ornamental look to it. So this is something that's even more yellow. 
All right. So if you've got a coach lamp, you don't want to go out and you don't want to buy a new fixture. You know, um, you've got a globe lamp. You know, put something like this, which is an ornamental light, which is only 2200. They sell these also in 2700. OK, that's got that's got less blue white light. So you can also use that as an alternative to the yellow light that's not an LED. Can you hold that up again? I'm going to take a picture of it. That's how I do my shopping now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Well, you can, you. You, can see, you can see these at all the hardware stores now. They might cost you a little bit more money. But if you want something that looks kind of ornamental, that's what you're going to want to use. Okay. And that basically is in this box here. Okay. Okay. Sounds otherwise, good. Otherwise, you're looking for just the typical light bulb box, and you want to find that soft white label. And okay. you can you'll find 2700K. It'll be on the box somewhere. It might only be in a little square that's kind of like you know your your food calorie thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it'll be there. You'll find it. Okay. Thank oh. you. So you didn't, uh, you, you focused mo most of your talk on the outdoor lights, but on the indoor lights, those are also shining outside in our windows if we're not shading them. I mean, I, I noticed I, when my neighbor across the alley has yeah. keeps their kitchen light on all night long and it lights up my whole house. I mean, yeah. I, I, I noticed a big difference on that. And I, so I'm wondering if there are any... Well, when the International Dark Sky Association started, there weren't even LEDs, okay? LEDs hadn't even been invented yet. It, it was mostly, you know, something that astronomers founded. And, and the thought was, well, how can we improve our dark, dark sky at night, regardless of the light bulb that we're using? But you're right, Mary, uh, you know, whether it's, it's an outdoor fixture or an indoor fixture, um, you know, think twice about the light bulb that you're using inside that might cause that glare across the driveway onto your neighbor's your neighbor's house. Um, and 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 the reason for that is even more significant now that we're going to the brighter LEDs inside, because that light just shoots out like a bullet. Mm -hmm. It's incredible, right, Catherine? You're kind of talking about that light that's a, you know, in the yard next to you. Mm -hmm. It's just incredible how intense the LED lights are. I thought that it was age that was making other people's headlights when I'm driving more annoying than ever. Is it? Are they using LED in those in, in headlights in cars now? Is that well, why they're seeing so much? Some of them, you think people have their brights on. I can't believe all those people have their brights on. Yeah, they're halogens or there's something to that effect, but they are just so much more white and bright. Mm -hmm. So it's a good example of glare. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you think about glare, some of us think about headlamps or we think about light trespass, you know, like the light that you just talked about, Catherine, that glare that comes across or the light that's coming out of Mary's window or the neighbor's window. It's it's, so, it's an intense glare that's shining onto others. Um, but yeah, as we get older, especially our eyes age and we're, we, 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 we don't acclimate to those, that bright glare with the headlamps as well as we used to. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't know, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't lose myself when I'm gonna laugh. <laughs> yeah, anybody else? There's also some studies that suggest that if you've got lights on your pollinator gardens and your native plants, that you'll have less pollinators visiting, not less oh. pollinators visiting your plants at night. Oh, keep those dark. Uh oh. Yeah, keep your lights off your pollinator gardens. I wonder if the when you asked Peggy about the solar lights, I wonder if having solar lights because I last year I, I mean the last couple of years I, I bought these colored solar globes that I was putting within the flowers, so it was kind of lighting the flowers at night. But maybe I wonder if the moths go to the as much if or pollinators go if there's lights in dispersed within the flowers. You know, again, I, I don't know that our little solar lights are making a huge difference because I don't know that we're, I don't know that those little lights have as much of that blue white color. Right. 
um, but uh, you can buy solar lights that have less. You know, the patio lights, for example, the little patio lights that we now string, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Patios, for example, um, you can buy that in a soft white choice. You can buy that in a day white, daylight choice. You can buy that at a certain wattage. So, you know, it's kind of like, well, what am I looking for when I'm going to the store? Am I conscious about the effect that these lights are having on, on my, my health, my wildlife friends, my pollinators, my nocturnal moths? So you just want to start thinking about, oh, okay, I do have a choice and I can make a better choice with respect to the LED that I'm buying. Any other questions? All righty. Thank you so much for joining us, Adam. This was this was great. We got to. I'm going to turn everything off from now on. Um, and thanks everybody for attending tonight. And um, we'll, I'll be reaching out to you, Susan, and I'll be reaching out to you, Julie. And thank you. We kind of gave you an idea of some of the the visions that we have for Sag Moraine, and you know volunteer, go on the website, sign up to volunteer, email me. We'd love, we'd love you to get involved and, and help us with this. So um, spread the word and we will see you April 21st. We're having a webinar with Ben Fuda. He's going to talk about how to, uh, of Botany LLC, and he's going to talk about how to add native plants to existing landscapes. If you don't want to be starting from scratch, but you just want to add some native plants to your existing landscape, he's got a presentation for us again. That's April 21st uh, at uh, 7 p.m. And you can sign up on our website. That's a free webinar. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, Good night everyone. everyone. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Thank you Thanks all. Thanks for having Bye. me, everybody. Bye. Good, Good luck with night. your projects. I'll be following you. Great. Okay. Thank you. Great. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.